Welcome. We are delighted to have you tonight with our third um, talk in a series, uh, our spring series. And um, I wanted to announce that uh, next week we actually have two talks that we wanted to mention. So on Sunday, so this is off our regular schedule, we're so used to Monday nights at 5.30, but on Sunday night uh, at 5 o'clock in Moffitt Auditorium, we're having Dr. William Ferris, and he's an uh, um, award-winning, um, who's actually a Grammy Award winner. Um, he's written a number of books. He's well known for his photography on the civil rights movement, and that's what he's going to share with us on April the 2nd at 5 o'clock. And then we've got uh, Marcy Ferris. Dr. Marcy Ferris is coming, they're coming together. In fact, we're getting this wonderful uh, couple, and she's going to speak Monday at 12. So this will be our first daytime lecture in a long time. That one will be held in Walnut 101. So we hope that you can come then and join us. Her talk is Edible North Carolina, A Journey Across a State of Flavor. And so she um, has published a new book, Edible North Carolina, and we'll talk about food and the food culture in our state. So both of those should be really good. But who do we have tonight? Well, Kay Cook who is um, the former director of Arts and Humanities and one of our most valued committee members, is here to introduce our speaker, Tommy Jarrett. And thank you all for coming. Here's Kay. It is my pleasure to introduce Tommy Jarrett. He's known to many of us in this community as an outstanding lawyer and as such was elected by his peers to be president of the North Carolina State Bar. He's also practiced law while serving in Vietnam with the Marines Judge Advocate Corps. So not only has he served our country and this state, but he's also served this community in many capacities. He's been a county commissioner, chairman of the Board of Elections, and chairman of the Board of Trustees of this very institution, Lane Community College. And because of these and many other accomplishments, he was chosen to receive the Boy Scouts of America Distinguished Citizen Award. Beyond his commitment to this community, he has also many unusual interests, um, astronomy and storytelling. And although he may have dabbled in learning about the stars, he's also successfully competed, completed some down-earth accomplishments, like transporting a pig from Goldsboro to the mountains of Western North Carolina. Now, I've heard that story, and I hope you get to hear it too. He has serious storytelling credentials, and tonight that will be on display. Tonight, he will tell us about the American Vice Presidency. So I give to you a fine lawyer, a Marine, an occasional astronomer, and always an excellent storyteller. Tommy Jarrett. Yeah. I've got a mic on. I don't know whether I'm hooked up or not. Am I? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, nice introduction. Uh, I want to thank Charlotte for all the work she's done. I know I've pestered her uh, tremendously over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, Sometime back, I suggested that somebody out here ought to put on a program about the Vice Presidency of the United States. That was a good suggestion. <laughs> I followed up volunteering to do it, and that was a bad suggestion. <laughs> uh, there have been 49 Vice Presidents of the United States, including uh, Kamala Harris. She's number 49. I, I, I understand I got 50 minutes, so if I devoted one minute to each Vice President, uh, which would be an impossibility uh, I, I, that I just can't do. It's been exciting putting this together. I uh, learned some new things. I relearned some old things I'd forgotten. 
but the difficulty has been paring it down where I can get it in and uh, get it said in, in, in uh, 50 minutes. That's, that's really going to be the charge. But, so I better, I better uh, get underway. The first, thing that, first place to look is the Constitution of the United States. In the original unamended Constitution of the United States, where the president is alive and in good health, the vice president has two things. One, he presides at the Senate. And he votes, as in the Constitution says, if they be equally divided. In other words, he can break a tie vote. He can't debate. He can control the debate, perhaps, but he can't debate. Uh, so he's very limited in what he can do. He can appoint no committees in, in the Congress. So that limits his powers even further. The other thing that he can do and has been able to do from, from the original unamended Constitution all the way through the the Twelfth Amendment, which we're going to talk a little about, he's, he's, uh, the votes in the states get sent to him, he opens the certificates, and the votes are for President of the United States are tabulated. That is, the electoral votes are tabulated. So that's, that's what he does. That, those are his constitutional uh, uh, duties, and that's all that I can find in the original unamended Constitution. Now then, here we go. So let, let's start out with our very first vice president. Well, that, was, that wasn't what I was supposed to press. <laughs> there he is. John Adams. John Adams from Massachusetts, brilliant lawyer. Uh, he defended in 1775, he was a lawyer, defended the infamous British redcoats in the case known as the Boston Massacre, not only did he defend them, they were found not guilty. It took a lot of brass to do that, and, and he did it. I wonder if he were running today what the TV ads would say about that. I can hear them now. Just, uh, it, it, it would be interesting to hear what, what they would have to say about him for, for doing what he did. Uh, he, uh, in, in the first, for the first four elections, uh, you may or may not recall from your uh, history, the, the states chose electors, and each state got the same number of electors that it had in the Congress. That is, a small state, for example, would have two senators and one member of the House of Representatives, so it would have three electors. Same way today, same procedure as far as that goes. And so then what happens is, in the, the first four elections, uh, each elector had two votes, not one vote, each elector had two votes, and everybody was running for president. Nobody ran for vice president. So everybody knew who the first president was going to be, and that was going to be George Washington. You can see over there, this is the first election. It's, t it's tabulated over there. He got 69 votes. Uh, John Adams was second with, looks like, 34 votes. Uh, so he, he, he was second, and he became the vice president, and there were the other votes were sprinkled among all those other, all those other people. Uh, John Adams really didn't like being vice president. Uh, he complained about it on more than one occasion. Uh, he didn't think he had the authority or the respect that, that he thought he was entitled to. Nevertheless, he did the best he could. He always did what, whatever Washington asked of him. Uh, except one time, Washington asked him to go to, uh, I believe it was go to uh, Europe and help negotiate a commercial treaty, and he refused to go, stating that if, if I go, it'll, it'll take a long time to get over there, a long time to negotiate, a long time to get back, and if something happens to you while I'm gone, then we won't have any leadership. So he refused to go. That's the only thing that he ever was asked to do by Washington that he didn't do. Now. He's, uh, I would venture, although he was first, uh, I would venture he was probably our best vice president up until, let's say, 1900. Uh, others, others would disagree. He's not, he was not a perfect man. Uh, he would carry a grudge forever. It might be a big grudge. It might be a little petty something. The story on him was he kept a book of slights I know, I, know, I know he didn't have it written down, it was all in his head, but if you crossed him, he never forgave you. He was always ready to get, get back at you. So 
So he, was, he could be, and he's been described as being petty. Far be it for our first vice president to be petty, but that's what some people said. Anyway, he served for the first term, and the, then the, uh, four years later, uh, uh, the, the election comes up again, and he, uh, Washington again, uh, wins the presidency, and uh, he's, he's elected vice president. You can see there's more electoral votes now. There's 132 for Washington. He, he got them all both times, and I'll explain that to you right now in a second. And this time, he got 77 votes for uh, John Adams. The reason for it is more states ratified the, the uh, Constitution. And, he, and speaking of that, this is a bit of important trivia for all of us North, Carolina, North Carolinians to remember, and that is, who, who did we vote for in the very first election? I showed you the results there. We didn't vote for anybody. And, and the reason for that was, we had yet to ratify the Constitution and we refused to ratify it because it didn't have a Bill of Rights. That's something that all North Carolinians should take pride in, is, is we held out until we had a Bill of Rights. In this particular case here, we're down, we're number third from the bottom. We looks like we got 12 votes. We vote 12 for, it looks like, uh, Washington and 12, I guess, for Adams. I, I, don't, I can't see that very well. At any rate, that's what it looks like, like from here. So anyway... This was, this was the second presidential election, and the way it was supposed to work ideally was like this. Each elector had two votes, and the first vote, the elector is supposed to sit there and say, who's going to be the best president? So he voted for that person. And then he's supposed to say, well, who's going to, who, on all the list of the people that want to be president, who's going to be the next best? So he votes for that person. That's the way ideally it was supposed to work. And it worked that way, let's say, for the first two times. Now we're moving on. There was trouble on the horizon, and George Washington saw the trouble. He saw it in his second administration, where Adams and Hamilton were moving over here into what was called the Federalist Party. Jefferson and his little buddy, uh, James Madison, were moving over here into what was called, for a time, the Anti-Federalist Party. And Washington saw the danger of that, what he perceived to be the danger of it. He called them factions. He despised the factions that he saw uh, uh, coming, coming along. We call them political parties. If you ask George Washington, he were here, Mr. Washington, what party were you a member of? He'd say, I, I was a member of no party, which is true. But if you look at what he did and said, those kind of things, he sort of tilted towards the Federalists. But he, he, would, he would tell you he was not a member of any, of any faction. That's what, it, that's what he would say. Now then, we're now to the third election, and uh, Washington's not running. This time, of course, Adams is running. He's been waiting in the wings uh, for eight years. He thinks he ought to be president. Why not? I've been, I've, been, I've been waiting in the wings. I've been dutiful. I've done everything George Washington said, practically everything and I deserve it, and I'm running. Well, Thomas Jefferson had another idea. He thought he deserved it equally as well, so he puts his name in the hopper. It, here, you had two close friends, Adams and Jefferson. They both were instrumental in the, getting the Declaration of Independence passed. Jefferson was the principal author of it. Adams was the principal, I'll call it, floor manager. It had no, had no vocal opposition. The opposition was they knew if they did it and they failed, they'd either be executed or they'd serve a long prison sentence, which is, that's a sobering reason not to go along with the Declaration of Independence. After the Revolution and before the Constitution was, a, was uh, hammered out in the summer of 1787, they were in Europe together. They were great friends. They, they were just best friends you could, you could have, uh, but when this, this election took place, it was not, it was not nice. Uh, you learned the, you heard the word Sally Hemings were thrown around, for example. All y'all know who she was. And there were other, other things that, that were said that were, uh, 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 it, 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 but 
The candidates themselves did not do it. They were above the fray. It was done through surrogates and pamphlets and newspapers. It was not a, it was not a, a happy time. The end result was Adams won. Uh, Jefferson uh, finished, as you can see, a close second. And, and the friendship of uh, those two began to unravel. And, and you've heard the end of it. Uh, there's another chapter coming up. The end result was they became bitter enemies. They wouldn't speak to each other. Later in their lives, they began a correspondence back and forth. They never did repair their relationship uh, to where it should have been. But anyway, that's, that's, the, that's the history between Jefferson and, and Adams. So Adams wins, and so the, the fourth election comes up. Okay, the last election we had a president who was of this mindset, a vice president who was that, of that mindset. They didn't get along. There was, there was almost no cooperation between the two of them. So here's what we're going to do this time. Jefferson is running as a team with Aaron Burr. Adams is running as a, 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 as a team with Pinckney of South Carolina. And you can see the electoral vote. Remember, they're all running for president, although everybody knows that Burr is supposed to be the vice president if Jefferson wins. Everybody knows that Adams is supposed to be the, the president if Pinckney wins, or if, or if they, as in this case, it turned out there was a tie over here. So, uh, Burr said, you know, I, I'm supposed to be the vice president, but when it got around to conceding to, John, uh, to uh, Thomas Jefferson, he would not concede. Because it was a tie, it went into the House of Representatives, and it stayed in there quite some time. The end result was that Jefferson won, I think, on the 34th vote in the House of Representatives, and when it goes in the House of Representatives, it's, it's voted by states. Each state has one vote. If it happened today, Wyoming would have one vote, California would have one vote. Well, that's the same way it was back, in. back then. The small states got a vote. The large states still only had one vote. Jefferson finally won, and he won because Hamilton disliked Burr more than he disliked Jefferson. There was some bad blood already between Hamilton and Burr because Burr had unseated Hamilton's father-in-law in from the U.S. Senate in New York. So you already had a little bubbling going on in the cauldron. So he supported, uh, he used his influence to try to, to uh, cause Federalist members of the House of Representatives to vote in their ca state caucuses to vote for Thomas Jefferson that put Jefferson over the hump. He became president. Burr became vice president. Now, how well do you think Jefferson and Burr got along? They hated each other. Burr got to do nothing except he could come and preside over the Senate. That's the only thing he got to do, which was about the only thing Thomas Jefferson got to do previously. So that's what he did. While he was still president, he heard that Alexander Hamilton had insulted him by saying he was dangerous, which he was. He challenged Hamilton to a duel, which Hamilton accepted. Of all the customs that ever man devised, dueling is the absolute worst custom. What does, what does it do? It gets somebody killed, perhaps. Did it, did it decide who was right? No. Does it prove who was wrong? No. It doesn't solve anything, it just makes matters worse. So they go across into New Jersey, incidentally, where Hamilton's son had been killed in a duel, almost the exact spot. They have a shootout. Hamilton is, uh, is shot. They bring him back across uh, the, the uh, river to New York where he dies. And that was, of course, that whole episode was the begin beginning of the, and the end of Aaron Burr. He later on got into some kind of, I never did understand it, some kind of a conspiracy to set up his own country, either in the Spanish territories or in, in the Louisiana Purchase territories. I never understood all that. Anyway, they put him on trial for treason. He was found not guilty. Uh, he, he, never, uh, he never came out of it. His reputation was, was ruined, as well it should. Uh, uh, Mr. Jarrett says he's the worst vice president we ever had. 
Okay, what did, what did we do with those two episodes? Well, we, the Congress uh, recommended to the states and the states ratified the 12th Amendment. Nothing uh, unusual here except this was the first presidential race under the 12th Amendment. It was Jefferson and George Clinton for vice president. You can see over there it was an overwhelming landslide in favor of, of Jefferson and Clinton, 162 electoral votes to 14. That's, that's a pretty commanding uh, and devastating uh, uh, victory for, for Jefferson. Uh, footnote for George Clinton, uh, he's one of two vice presidents to serve under separate presidents. He served in Jefferson's second term, and I, he served one term, I think, for James Madison. So that, he's, that's his footnote that he gets there. That's all I can say about him. That's all I know about him. All right. Now, we're going to jump ahead. We're, we're jumping to uh, 1824. Uh, incidentally, let me go back and say that uh, remember our friend John Adams holding a grudge when Jefferson got inaugurated and sworn in as president? He was in the stagecoach headed north. He did not attend uh, Jefferson's inauguration. And you're going to see that's a family tradition because it's going to happen again right here in just a few minutes or we're going to describe it. So this time... All right, what we had, we had ongoing the, what was called the era of good feelings. What had happened was the United States had won the War of 1812, which nailed down our independence, and they passed the Missouri Compromise, which, quote, solved the slavery question temporarily. So we had the era of good feelings. And during this era of good feelings, it, the Secretary of State became the launch pad for the presidency. Madison became president after being Jefferson's Secretary of State. Monroe became president after being Madison's Secretary of State. John Quincy Adams became president after being Monroe's Secretary of State. Now, we're, now here, this, that sets the stage for, for this, uh, this, this race here. John Quincy Adams, he'd been Secretary of State. Why can't I be president like all the ones in front of me? Well, this guy, this, uh, some would say this wild man from Tennessee, born allegedly in North Carolina, more likely in South Carolina, by the name of Andrew Jackson, uh, he wants to be president. And he's our first non-aristocrat president. He doesn't make it this time. You can see now that some of the states are beginning to allow popular votes. So you can see those vote tallies over there. But what happened was he got the most popular vote. He did not get uh, the, uh, uh, more than half of the electoral votes so he was not elected. It went in the House of Representatives. This one did. And you'll notice the man on the right over there is Henry Clay. Henry Clay uh, finished fourth, so he, he, didn't, his, he didn't go into the House. It, they only, under the 12th Amendment, they take the top three. Those top three vote getters, they went into the House of Representatives, and, hit, and uh, uh, John Quincy Adams became the president, elected by the House of Representatives. Andrew Jackson was good with that for a while until he found out that John Quincy Adams appointed Henry Clay Secretary of State. What does that mean? <laughs> they are moving Clay up to try to be the next president in front of me. He called that the corrupt bargain. That ended the era of good feelings. Let, believe me right now. And it, it ended it real soon too. So, so the next time Jackson came back with a vengeance he beats John Quincy Adams. He comes back the next time. He beats Henry Clay. And so now I'm, I'm fast forwarding ahead. There he is. There's Jackson. That's a cartoon of him. And you can see he, the, the cartoonist has got him standing on the, the Constitution shredded. And over there he's standing on uh, bills, laws, shredded. One of them is the U.S. Bank, which he failed, would not uh, renew. And there's internal improvements which the Whigs uh, supported that he did not support. And he's got a veto in his left hand and the scepter of power in the right hand and he's got his uh, crown on and down below, King Andrew I. During all this time, he had built up animosities and he didn't care really. He, he had built up animosities and, and he was elected twice and he had defeated them and here are his main uh, antagonists. John C. Calhoun, they had a, they had a uh, he was vice president under uh, uh, 
uh, Andrew Jackson, and he resigned. They had a falling out over the tariff. They had a stare down. Uh, Daniel Webster, uh, we had a, they had a falling out over the Indian removal. Henry Clay, I mean, they were at each other's throats uh, uh, really all the time. At any rate, there, there was a political party that grew up, if I can get this thing to work, there was a political party that grew up called the Whigs. And the only thing that unified the Whigs was their dislike of, of Andrew Jackson. Why did they pick the name Whigs? They took it from the English Whigs. In England, there were two parties back at this particular time. There were the Tories, which almost always supported the crown, and there were the Whigs, who on occasion would not support the crown, and on many occasions didn't support the crown. And since Jackson was the king, we're in opposition to him, we're the Whigs. So that's how they named themselves, and, and uh, that's, that's how the Whig party came into, came into play. So, Jackson, Jackson's vice president is now running for president. And the Whigs had an unusual, I'm, was, I'm using a lot of time here, gosh. The Whigs tried an unusual strategy. They didn't have anybody they think that they could, that could beat him. They didn't think they could beat him. So they ran a bunch of regional candidates. You'll see Harrison's name, White's name. Uh, you'll see... Uh, uh, Daniel Webster's name down there somewhere, and over, further over, you'll see somebody from North Carolina. The idea was, we're going to siphon off all these electoral votes with these regional candidates, we're going to go into the House of Representatives, and we're going to beat this guy. The strategy was, uh, was a good strategy. The only thing it achieved was, it almost beat this guy running for vice president. I counted up the, the, the electoral votes, he got precisely 50% of them, he needed one more vote, he had to go into the Senate. When he got in the Senate, they elected him vice president. He's the only trivia. He's the only vice president ever to be elected by the Senate. Now, okay. When Martin Van Buren was inaugurated, Jackson was in town, and he was in gloat mode. He had beat him twice. His vice president had beat him again. And he is just as happy as he can be. And one person asked him, they said, what are your regrets? He said, I've got two. What are they? He said, I should have had him to hang John C. Calhoun, and I, I should have had him to shoot Henry Clay. He said, those were the only two. Anyway, that's our friend Andrew Jackson. As things happen, uh, uh, Brent Van Buren had, had, had a bad piece of luck. He had a panic. They, back then they called them panics. Today they call them recessions or depressions. Anyway, they had a panic. Uh, things didn't go well. So this time, the Whigs really come back with a vengeance. They run William Henry Harrison, John Tyler for vice president, Tibby Canoe and Tyler too. You all have heard that. That was one of the first. That it had the trappings almost of a modern campaign. Not quite, not so much, but it was sort of beginning the trappings of a modern campaign. And you can see that Tibby Canoe and Tyler, too, uh, really put it on uh, Martin Van Buren and uh, Mr. Johnson. The, the electoral vote is it's a landslide uh, in their favor. And the Whigs were ecstatic. We have finally beat that guy. We, we didn't beat him, but we beat his surrogate this time. We're, 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 we're good to go. Funny thing happened. Uh, William Henry Harrison uh, gave a stem-winding speech. Not a funny thing, sad thing. He gave a stem-winding long speech at his inaugural. He got pneumonia, and he died after about 30 days. And John Tyler now becomes, did he become president, or did he become acting president? Turns out that John Tyler was not a true Whig. He didn't believe in internal improvements. He didn't believe in it at all. He was actually more of an ally of Calhoun than he was an ally of Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. So what did he do? He declared himself president. He moved in the White House. He took the oath of office as, as president of the United States. And the Whigs said, you can't do that. You, what you're doing, you're trying to jump in line in front of, 
of, uh, of Henry Clay. You're, you are not the president. So they had a little debate, and this is the constitutional provision. I've drawn a line to separate. The top provision that I put up there, this is Tyler. In case of the removal of the president from office or his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the office, said office, in bold twice, the same shall devolve on the vice president. He's saying the office devolved on me, and now I'm the president. John Quincy Adams, who was back in the House of Representatives and was a pretty good lawyer, incidentally, said, look, here's the way it's supposed to be construed. Same language. In case of the removal of the president from office or his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president. They said, the only thing you've got, you're still the vice president. You just got now got the powers and duties of the president. Was that, if that wasn't enough, all they had to do was read a part of the 12th Amendment which says, and if the House of Representatives shall not choose a president whenever the right of choice shall devolve upon them, that is, if they've got a, the House has to do it, they're supposed to do it before March the 4th, because that's Inauguration Day, or, or yeah, that was in, uh, whenever they're going to count the votes, then the Vice President shall act as president as in the case of death, or other constitutional disability of the president. It's up to you, but my opinion is he was acting president. That's, that's, my, that's my call. But who am I to, uh, to say that? Because what happened was every president, ever, it happened every time since then, and they've all became presidents, every one of them. Uh, Millard Fillmore, uh, uh, Johnson, uh, both Johnsons, uh, all of them, uh, when the president died, they, bec they became president. And, and that little problem wasn't solved until the 25th Amendment, which was enacted in 1967. We'll talk about that in a minute. I've got Ru William Rufus King listed here for so one reason. Uh, he was from Sampson County over here. Uh, he was a local politician. He uh, served in the local House of Representatives. He served in Congress. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm reading between the lines, I think he was a very wealthy person. And I also read between the lines, he must have been a big plantation operator. And I'm thinking that perhaps the soil played out on him because they didn't have the, uh, things like crop rotation and other kinds of things we have today to preserve the topsoil. Anyway, he went to Alabama and he uh, established himself down there he founded the town of Selma, Selma, Alabama, that we've all heard about in, at one time or another. He got the name from a poem. Uh, he, he got elected to the Senate. And remember now, back then, the state legislatures elected the senators. They didn't stand for popular vote like they do now. They were elected by the legislatures. He got himself elected uh, to the U.S. Senate, and he ran with uh, Franklin Pierce, and they won, and he became the uh, uh, vice president, but he was sick. Uh, he had consumption, which we today know as tuberculosis. And you know how some people, they, they get, uh, even today, if they're told there's nothing else we can do for you, they hear there's a, oh, there's a cure. He heard there was a miracle cure in Cuba. So he goes to Cuba. By special act of Congress, he's authorized to take the oath of office outside the United States, trivia question, he's the only one ever to do that. Of course there was no cure in Cuba. Of course there was no magic cure. So he comes back to Alabama, he lives three days and dies. Now we're up to the Civil War. When, when Lincoln ran for president, he was a Westerner. Illinois, that was deemed the West. They needed an Easterner and, and the, the, the man was, the one they chose was Hannibal Hamlin the picture you see here. These other people you see were also running for president. John Bell up there and Edward Everett, they were the candidates of the uh, Constitutional Union Party. The two guys down below, Stephen Douglas, who you've heard of, was the candidate of the Northern Democrats. John C. Breckinridge over there was the candidate of the Southern Democrats. There was a very fractured electorate. Lincoln and Hamlin, Hamlin got 40% of the vote, but they got the majority of the electoral votes. Lincoln was elected. Hamlin was his vice president. Hamlin uh, 
believed that he was a part of the legislative branch. He hardly ever came around the White House. And on top of that, Mrs. Lincoln didn't like him very much, which is a good, good thing, I think. That, that, that's, that's all right. That doesn't bother me. But what I like about Hannibal Hamlin is he was a member of what I would call the main National Guard. They got activated uh, in, during the Civil War, and he went with them as a corporal and as a cook. Now, he didn't have to go. They told him, you're the vice president. You don't have to go. And I know he could have used his influence. He could have become an officer, but he didn't. He stayed as an enlisted person, a corporal, and a cook. Now, they wouldn't let him get in harm's way. In, in Marine Corps terminology, he was always in the rear with the gear. And, <laughs> and that's where I was in Vietnam. I was in the rear with the gear. You can, you can count on it. At, at any rate, he's of, of the unsung, he's become my favorite. Hannibal, I like you a lot, and I don't care what Mrs. Lincoln said about you. It appeared for a long time that Lincoln was going to be defeated, but when Sherman finally took Atlanta, and when David Farragut took Mobile Bay, it changed 180 degrees. Lincoln's popularity picked way up, and it became evident that Lincoln was going to be reelected, but they wanted a broader approach this time. So instead of running uh, as Republicans, they ran on the National Union Party, and what they did was they eased my friend Hannibal, Hannibal, Hannibal Hamlin out. Uh, they eased him just right on out, and you know, I'm, I'm sure it stung. I'm sure it didn't make him happy to know. You know, anytime you get pushed aside, uh, you know, it didn't make you feel good, but I want to say this for him. He went back to Maine. He, he was still a good citizen. He went back to Maine. He became a United States senator and did some other good things, which he didn't go off in a hole somewhere and sulk, uh, like our friend John Adams might have done. John Adams, boy, he would have, I'd hate to see what he would have to say about had he been treated like that. At any rate, uh, they wound up with Andrew Johnson, another North Carolina boy, born in Raleigh, North Carolina. And for whatever reason, well, let, let me back up a little bit. His folks were dirt poor. And as a young age, his mother hired him and his brother out for service. In other words, he and his brother were, uh, what do you call these, uh, servants. Uh, seven years, well, I forgot what the terminology is. Quasi-slaves. And I know she was getting the money for their labors, and he didn't like that. He broke free and he hid out around the area. He finally wound up in Tennessee and he became a politician over there and he was elected to the Senate and he was there when the South seceded. Now, it took a lot of brass to do what he did. He did not secede. He was the only one. He stayed in the Senate when everybody else pulled out and left. Uh, he stayed and he, and he served out his term, which I think it had like two years to go. He served out his term, whatever that was, that made him widely popular in the North. It made him hated in the South. There was at least one credible conspiracy to kill him uh, that, that did not materialize. So he became vice president. He got off to a bad start, frankly, because he was drunk when he gave his inaugural speech. That's, that, that, that's not a good way to get started, but, but if... You know, if you're going to get started, uh, that's, I guess that's one way to get started. Anyway, he got off at a, to a, bad, a bad go here. Uh, I've, I've seen the story told both ways. It, he did a great job, and he was bullied by these radicals up there, and I've heard the other side of the story. He did a lousy job, and he just, you know, but whatever, it, things didn't work out. Uh, it got around where he was trying to fire Secretary of War Stanton. Now Stanton and Andrew Johnson should have been friends. They were both what they called war Democrats. They were Democrats who believed in the Union and they stayed with the North, they stayed with the Union. You would think they're gonna be friends here. They're, they're, they're gonna be friendly. But they weren't for whatever reason and I never did understand it. Actually, I read a book about his impeachment about a year ago, I promise you, I didn't know any more after I read the book than before I did. Uh, at any rate, they, the Congress, Congress said, okay, you have to have the Senate's approval to appoint these people. That's in the Constitution. 
We're passing a law that says you have to have the Senate's approval to fire him. And so what they were trying to do was to protect Stanton as Secretary of War. Well, he challenged that. He tried to fire him anyway. That was one of the accusations against him at his impeachment trial. He was impeached by the House. It went over to the Senate, and he was acquitted by one vote. He, he just skated by. Uh, he, uh, uh, he couldn't do anything after that. I mean, he, he never got renominated. He tried to run for president thereafter, but uh, nothing ever happened. But he, but he did. He did make it back to the Senate after the smoke had cleared. I guess the Tennessee legislature reelected him, and he went back to the Senate, but I don't think he served. I think he died shortly thereafter. So there's our friend Andrew Johnson. Now then, come, we're, moving, we're getting now into the last century. I, I've got the wrong uh, uh, sign up there. I apologize. I should have the, uh, candidates in 1900, not 1904. But here's, here's what happened. Uh, William McKinley had been president, and his vice president had died. So they needed, they needed somebody to run with McKinley in 1900. And uh, so they, they said, what about this guy, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the governor of New York? He was widely popular. He was just as, man, he was popular. And he was powerful. Uh, and and uh, this one senator, can't think of the guy's name, uh, I'll think of it when I don't need to know it. Uh, this one senator said, well, look, why don't we run him for vice president? We'll accomplish two things. One, he'll give us, he'll, he'll help McKinley get reelected because he's so very highly popular, and two, we'll get rid of him. When you point him to the, get him up there as vice president, the only thing he can do is, is go in and preside over the Senate. And, and, and uh, they underestimated Theodore Roosevelt badly on that. And, and the, the same guy, Mark Hanna was his name. Mark Hanna referred to him as the wild man. And after he got, got elected as vice president, you know, he, you couldn't handle him either, that way, way either. He, I mean, he was making speeches and talking around. And Hanna said, there's only one life between that madman and the presidency. That's exactly what he said about the guy that he put in as vice president. And so when he heard that McKinley had died, he said, look now, that damn cowboy is president of the United States. <laughs> and he was. So, uh, but when he ran the next time, the, the Charles, as president, Charles Fairbanks was his vice president. And, and so when Roosevelt decided not to run again, to show you how they, uh, uh, I know Fairbanks must have thought, you know, who am I? Instead of Theodore Roosevelt backing Charles Fairbanks, he backed William Howard Taft, who was his longtime friend. And incidentally, it's not to be talked about today, but they had a big falling out too. Now we're, at the, now we're up to Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt was, was the only person to be elected four times. He didn't serve but about, three, about four or five months of the, of the fourth term. But his first uh, vice president was John Nance Garner, whose nickname was Cactus Jack. Uh, I, have, I have heard somewhere along the way that his, John Nance Garner's uh, ancestors were from Wayne County. Does anybody know anything about that? I, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I, I've heard that. That needs to be researched, I guess. At any rate, uh, John Nance Garner and FDR got along well. He'd been Speaker of the House, and... and uh, 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 and he and Roosevelt were of one mind for about a term and a half. They, they, the first term, they're good. The second term, it's not getting too good. So John Nance Garner wanted to be the president too. So he ran for president in uh, 1940. That would have been 32, 36, yeah, it would have been 1940. And of course, Franklin Roosevelt couldn't run with him, so he chose a, a, a man by the name of... Uh, Wallace, Henry Wallace, and uh, uh, John Nance Garner, I don't think ever had a, uh, uh, another uh, a public uh, elective job. I think he went back to Texas. And uh, at any rate, the next, uh, next vice president under FDR was this uh, 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 Henry Wallace, 
And he did some good things. Uh, uh, FDR gave him a lot of power to work towards getting private business ready to go on a war footing. In other words, get ready. We're, we're probably going to go to war, and you're going to have to stop making this, and you're going to have to stop making that because we're going to need that to fight a war. He did those kinds of things, but he stepped on some toes. He became a political liability. So when FDR ran the last time, he chose Harry Truman, and we got a gem, in my opinion, out of when we got Harry Truman. Truman is the last president who didn't have a college degree, but he had done a lot of reading about the presidency, and he probably knew more about the presidency than any modern-day president that we've had. He, he really knew it, and he had respect for the office. And uh, interesting point, Truman was about president for about five months before Roosevelt died, and Truman's antennas were up. He said, you know, something's going on, and they're not telling me what it is, so he went to Henry Stimson, Secretary of War, and said, Henry, something's going on, and I want you to tell me what it is. And Henry Stimson said, don't worry, Harry, you'll know in due course. Well, what it was was the Manhattan Project. They're developing the bomb, and they won't even tell Harry Truman, the vice president. So, uh, the interesting bit of irony here. The Germans surrender, and Truman goes, and, and, and they're going to meet with Stalin, and he meets with Churchill first, and they discuss, should we tell Stalin about the, about the bomb? Yeah, let's tell him in so many words. So they met with Stalin, and, and Truman said, we have this powerful weapon under study, which if used, might win the war. And Stalin just nodded his head. The irony of all that is, Stalin knew about that bomb before Truman did. <laughs> he did. He did, because there were two or three guys at Los Alamos that were spies, or communist sympathizers. One of, one of them was Klaus Fuchs. He made a, a, a screwy drawing of that bomb, or well, parts of that bomb, and dropped it off at the Soviet embassy. Stalin knew about the bomb before Truman did. So what did Truman do? Uh, in 19, I think it was 1947, uh, Truman, at Truman's instance, the, president, the, the vice president of the United States was made a statutory member of the National Security Council. That body still exists today. What that does, that gives the vice president literally and figuratively a seat at the table. So our vice president will know uh, what the heck's going on, you know? Uh, uh, in other words, it, it, and that's a big deal in the involvement of the uh, pr uh, modern day vice presidency. In my opinion, that may be the biggest benchmark that, that's, that has uh, been laid down towards the involvement upwards of the office of the vice president. Okay, now then, here, here's, we're, we're we're working here. I may, I may, I, I turn third. I'm headed for home here. Uh, here, here's something else that was substantially uh, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, thing was the 25th Amendment that became uh, part of our Constitution. I think in 1967, the the very first uh, section one, in case of the removal of the president from office or of his death or resignation. The vice president shall become president. Made an honest man out of uh, John Tyler right there, I'll tell you right now. That, that, I mean, that, that, that says it. And then it also filled a hole. It says, wherever there is a vacancy in the office of the vice president, the president shall nominate a vice president who shall take office upon confirmation by a majority vote of both houses of Congress. That, that filled a hole that we had. Our, our country had gone... 37 years at various points in time where we didn't have a vice president. It'd be where the president, moved, the, vi uh, the president died and the vice president moved up or where the vice president died. And we had seven vice presidents to die. So you can see there were holes there and that section two lets that hole be filled. A and, and then, uh, now we'll go down, go down to s number four. This, this puts the vice president 
uh, squarely in the executive branch of government as far as I'm concerned. It talks about when the vice president and a majority of either the principal officers, that's the cabinet, of the executive departments, et cetera, if they think the president is, is disabled and can't, uh, can't perform, uh, in that case, they report that to the uh, Speaker of the House and the uh, uh, President pro tempore of the Senate, and what happens there is that the, the, vice the, the Vice President becomes acting president until the disability is either removed or continued. So that, that was an important uh, thing that, that happened, and that happened in 1967. So, now, we're coming to January 6, 2021. And that's a quote from the 12th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. That's when uh, one person said that the president of the Senate, that would have been Mike Pence, had the, had the I don't remember exactly what he said, but he was trying to say that Pence could uh, decertify ballots, or whatever it was he was trying to say. There it is right there in the 12th Amendment. There is nothing in there that states or implies that Mike Pence had the authority to do what they were trying to get him to do. And uh, I'm just glad that uh, on that day, on, on January 6th, I'm glad that the Secret Service got Mike Pence out of there before they ran into some of those people because those, uh, uh, he has, as Vice President, he has Secret Service protection and somebody was, somebody might have got hurt bad uh, but it didn't happen. So now, there's our current vice president, Kamala Harris. Uh, first woman, first uh, person of uh, Asian ancestry, first person of African American ancestry. And, and she is relevant, and she's very relevant and for this reason if no other. Remember, she gets to break a tie. The Senate is so close She's, she is tied now with John Adams with 29 times she's voted to break a tie. The only person ahead of her is uh, our friend uh, from South Carolina. Uh, he had his picture there a minute ago. John C. Calhoun, I think he's at 31. So, I mean, it, she's just two away. Uh, if I got it right, she's only two away uh, from... Uh, 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 tying the record, and, and, if, and she's, uh, if she stays in there t uh, two more years, a year and a half, ever how long it is, I think the odds are that there will be more than two uh, tie votes coming up, and so she will hold that record. Now, there are a few things, kind of, I got a little laundry list here of, of a few things that's helped Build, build up the vice presidency. But I, wa I, want to, I want to remind everybody that still the vice president, except for these narrow constitutional duties that's been expanded, for example, in the, by the 25th Amendment, under the, but under these narrow constitutional duties, uh, the vice president can only do what the president lets the vice president do. That's, it's still that way. And it's going to continue to be that way. But the good news is, all of, all of the modern presidents, and it began with Truman when he, when he put that, insisted that they put that in the law that the vice president would be a member of the National Security Council. From Truman on, it's been a, it's been a steady growth. And one of the reasons is the doggone job of the president is getting so doggone big. It, it's, 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 a heck of, it's a heck of a job. It's a big job. And it gets bigger all the time. And, and as long as the, the two occupants of president and vice president, regardless of whether you like their politics, as long as they like each other and respect each other, I think we're going to be all right. The problem would be if you ever got a situation going back, if you had a, and let's hope it doesn't happen, if you go back to a situation where you've got John Adams of this mold, a great man, Thomas Jefferson over here of another mold, 
another great man, but they don't see eye to eye. If, if we ever have that, then you'd, you'll still have uh, a, a lot of problems and chaos. But, but basically, the modern day presidents uh, uh, are, are, and the vice presidents are doing a good job, both parties, uh, and, and working with the vice president to achieve, uh, to achieve the objectives that they want to achieve. Now, you may not like their objectives of this president or that president, but nevertheless, they, uh, I, I, think, I think they're working well, well together. So, uh, and there, there have been some other things that have elevated the, uh, the, the, the office. Uh, and I want to give a nod here to Richard Nixon. Nixon, Nixon seized upon Truman's making the vice president the, the, a member of the National Security Council, and he liked foreign affairs, and he utilized that. And also, Eisenhower had some health problems. Eisenhower had a heart attack, he had a little stroke, and he had ileitis, which today we call Crohn's disease. So they, they arranged, they made a little written agreement on what you can do uh, to, uh, uh, if, if, if Ike gets, uh, gets sick and, it, and, and incapacitated. So that, that was a good thing. In 1961, the vice president got offices in the White House complex. This time it was across the road in the old executive office building. 1962, the vice president got Secret Service protection. Then in 1967, the 25th Amendment was passed that we just talked about. And, uh, and then in 1976 and 77, Walter Mondale and Jimmy Carter actually put in writing, I mean, it wasn't a, like a contract, it was just some ideas where Mondale could work in these areas, and uh, it, 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 it worked out great, and whether they put it in writing or not, most of the people who followed them have followed the, the Carter-Mondale uh, uh, situation. Mondale was the first one who got an office in the West Wing itself. Now they all got an office there. So, and then here's, here's one. In 1968, they proposed a, uh, a home for the vice president, and it became the Naval Observatory. Mondale was the first, uh, and his family are the first to live there. But in 1968, they proposed it, and they call it the 4-H Clubhouse. Home for Hubert Horatio Humphrey. <laughs> but Humphrey never got to live there. So, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't get to talk about uh, Millard Fillmore. <laughs> and, and, I, and I know I should have said something about Woodrow Wilson and Thomas Marshall. Uh, Thomas, Tom, uh, Thomas Marshall's got my... Uh, uh, I, I like him a lot because uh, he had to, he, he presided at more meetings uh, than any other vice president of the prior era because Woodrow Wilson was in uh, Europe for about six months negotiating the treaty after, in the immediate aftermath of World War I and Wilson came back and he, he got sick in Europe some people say he got the flu. It was during that flu pandemic. I say he had a light stroke. He got back, he had another light stroke, and then he had a terrible stroke. He, he lay prostrate. The only people to get in to see him were his wife and his press secretary. Nobody else could get in there. And they were negotiating the treaty where the United States would or would not join the League of Nations. Now, this was an important event. It's a cliche when we say politics makes strange bedfellows because what we had here was the opponents of the treaty wanted Woodrow Wilson to stay president because they knew he would not or he could not yield on any part of that treaty and as long as he would not or could not yield, they felt pretty darn sure they would defeat him. And they were afraid that if Thomas Marshall became acting president, he might yield a little bit on one or two points that would make the treaty more acceptable and the treaty might get passed. The opponents were right. Woodrow Wilson would not yield. The treaty failed and we can argue now 
would the, would the League of Nations done any good if the United States had been a member? I don't know. I don't know whether the League of Nations would have stood up to Adolf Hitler or not, but we know darn well nobody stood up to him with the way it turned out. Anyway, that's my presentation, and thank you very much. I think we have a question. time for a couple questions. If you have a question, if you'll um, raise your hand. To be sure, somebody has a question. I've done such a good job, you don't have any questions. <laughs> Tommy, what I want to thank year? My, my assistant, Ellen, back there. She has typed this thing and retyped this thing. <laughs> And she has turned it sideways and up and down, and she knows more about the vice presidents than, than I know. And she's sick of them, I'll promise you right now. Anyhow. Tommy, what year did president and vice president start running on the same ticket rather than voting for a president separately from a vice Last president? Year. Can Here we are. Back? I can't. Could you hear us? Well, I can hear you now. Who's talking? Hey, Tommy, it's Mary Mills Borden. What year did the president and vice president start running on the same ticket rather than voting for a president? And okay, then? it would have been in 18, 1804 when the, tw uh, the first uh, uh, time there, when uh, I showed it to you, when uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, Clint, George Clinton uh, got that uh, big uh, electoral uh, vote against Pinckney and some other person, 1804. But now I want to tell you, there's, there's one thing that probably needs to be said here. They, were, they still weren't bound together. The, the, the 12th Amendment says that the elector shall keep two distinct lists, one for president, one for vice president. And for years, an elector could still vote for whomever he wanted to vote for. What happened was, you raise a good point there, what happened was in 1968, that's the last time I know of it happening in North Carolina, one elector pledged to Richard Nixon, voted for George Wallace. And they said, well, well he can't do that. Well, he could do it. Not only couldn't he do it, he did it. So, <laughs> so state law now says this. It's a, it, this is what, when you go to vote, you're going to see the president and the vice president of your choice there. Are you going to see the president, the vice president of your choice there? And you don't vote separately. You vote for both of them. You pull that lever or mark whatever you do, and, and you're not really voting for them. You're voting for a, a set of pledged electors. You're voting for these 15 people that I mentioned a while ago who are electors. Now, by state law, here's the way it is in North Carolina. By state law, you sign a pledge to vote the way you're supposed to vote, the way you're pledged. And if you don't, the very second that you vote for somebody else, you nullify yourself as an elector and somebody else takes your place. <laughs> Boom, like that. And furthermore, you're subject to a $500 civil fine. That's, that's a lot of money. When they, when, when they put it in in 1968, that was probably, a, but that, that ain't peanuts, really, $500. It ought to be a lot more than that. It's not a crime in North Carolina. In some states, it's a crime. If you, it's called the unfaithful elector. If you don't vote the way you're supposed to in a lot of states, uh, it's, it's a crime, not in North Carolina. Any more questions? Hold on, I'm coming. Can you see me now? Pardon me? You can see me now. I, ca I can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> Tommy, there's some arguments about abolishing the Electoral College. What's the argument say, against say that, the- Say the, that again. The Electoral College. Electoral College. Yeah, there's, there's an argument. What, what's the argument to, for keeping it? Yeah. Probably shouldn't have it, but it's vacillated back and forth. Who gets the benefit of having it? Right now, the pendulum gives it to the rural states. 
it gives them a lot more power than the urban states, and that, that's, way, that's over to the Republicans. In the past, it, it, it favored the Democrats. It, it's wh whichever way the pendulum swings, if it swings in my favor, I love it. If it swings in your favor, I don't like it at all. That, that's the way it is. That's why we won't get rid of it. That, that's just that's my take on it. What system would replace it? Be the popular vote. Whoever got the most votes. Why, why, why doesn't that work? I, I just told you because because it it, it uh, the popular vote would favor would favor the Democrats right now. I mean they they got the most popular votes for about four out of the five, last five elections, but they didn't they didn't win them all because of the electoral vote. I mean, but it's been the other way. That, it's been the other way when the popular vote went the other way, and uh, I mean that that's that's why. Do you think it'll ever change? I doubt it. I doubt it. Okay. Any more? Any other questions? All right. Well, join us on Sunday if you can at five o'clock. Thank you. Pardon me? What? Oh, well, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad.